All right, good morning. Welcome back, everyone. I, I trust everyone can, can hear me OK. My name is Duncan De Pledge, and I'm a lecturer in geopolitics and security from Loughborough University in the United Kingdom. Uh, I've been asked us to steer, I've been asked to steer us through this next panel, which is titled Anticipating Future Threats Through Foresight and Experimentation. Now, the aim of this panel is really to explore different ways of approaching the future, but also futures in plural through strategic foresight and experimentation and to evaluate the utility of different methods for anticipating the nature and timing of future climate related shocks. Now, to this end, I'm delighted to say that we have three fantastic speakers lined up for you. Uh, the first is Paul Larcy from the Princeton Institute's International and Regional Studies Global Systemic Research Group at Princeton University. We have Lucia Retta, who is the Research Leader for Defence and Security at RAND Europe and Co-Director of RAND's Centre for Defence Economics and Acquisition. And we have the Honourable Sharon Burke, Founder and President of Ecospherics, who previously served in the US government, most recently as the Assistant Secretary of Defence for Operational Energy. Now, each speaker has been given up to 10 minutes to give a short presentation, after which we will open up to questions. Our first speaker is going to be Paul Larcy. So, Paul, over to you. Duncan, um, let's get my... Is that working? Great. OK. Hello, everyone. And so my name is Paul Arcee and I work uh, with the Global Systemic Risk Group in Princeton. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, uh, about the past as well as the future. And I just want to start off uh, because one of our main themes is globalization. So globalization uh, has been incredibly good for humanity. These are some of the benefits that we've seen from it. You know, a population of 190 million uh, at the year zero up to over 8 billion now life expectancy moving up everything looks uh, actually, you know, pretty pretty good so so why have we got so much anxiety and concern i've taken this from the latest uh, world economic forum report you know this is a uh, a study every year it's uh, uh, people who uh, really should be in the know about uh, global um, concerns um, and it's a longitudinal study. So only about 11% of this group think that things are looking good. Uh, everybody else very, very concerned, and especially 10% think progressive tipping points uh, could in can increase catastrophe. So globalization has given us benefits, but at the same time, it's also given us uh, uh, concern and anxiety, it keeps us awake at night. So our group is global systemic risk. So I thought I'd just quickly uh, get those terms out of the way. Our global system uh, is manifested by a set of tightly coupled interactions, allowing for the flow of goods and services, finance, and importantly, information. We are now very interconnected. Autarky is almost impossible now for the, for the world. Even the bottom billion uh, of our uh, fellow humans are, are interconnected in some way. But these complex interactions uh, of components uh, create new dynamics that can't always be explained by looking at the constituent components. So that's why we get risk. So systems can often have the appearance of incredible stability, uh, even as their fragility increases. And uh, you may be familiar with the work of Nassim Taleb, um, slightly a contrarian at times, but uh, he came up with a very interesting concept of anti-fragility. Um, we are creating systems that uh, are inherently fragile. We've seen an increasing emphasis on efficiency in global systems. And, you know, I used to work uh, very strongly in global industrial companies where everything was around just in time inventory, you know, absolutely down to the last minute to the last dollar. Fantastic. Until you have a shock like we've just had uh, in Ukraine, causing uh, enormous supply chain issues. Uh, the shocks, nothing compared to what we might see in China if China um, attacks Taiwan. So massive uh, gains, uh, but do we comprehend or grasp all the embedded risks uh, within the systems that we've created? So uh, as a group, we, we are interested in using multidisciplinary approaches on this. So uh, we work very much around complexity theory and we see society as a com complex adaptive system. Uh, that's where relations uh, within that system may be nonlinear. Um, 
uh, causing contagion. Also, you have great connections, but those connections might be uh, in one part of the system, not across the entire system. Um, and if anybody uh, is not aware of complex adaptive systems, there's a very nice little YouTube that I've put into there, uh, which one of our colleagues from the Stockholm Resilience Center has given a, a quick uh, introduction to. So complex systems involves a lot of different theories. That's why we like the multidisciplinary approach. So we talk with mathematicians, we talk with uh, behavioral psychologists, uh, and we talk a lot with um, uh, e ecologists because we, we see that they've worked very, very closely on looking at systems like food webs and so forth. What are the causes of collapse? Um, so how do societies collapse? Well, exogenous reasons, so it could be earthquakes, it could be uh, volcanoes, um, climate change or climate shifts, or endogenous systems that we've created ourselves, or it's a combination of the two, one can cause the other which brings us on to things like tipping points, cascades. So tipping points are where we get to a, a phase transition and we see that in nature, in materials, but we also see that in societies. When you get to a point when societies become too complex, uh, too, um, too dislocated and, and falls apart. The same with food systems, the same with uh, animal systems and networks. Cascades, where events just start uh, one upon the other, falling upon the other feedback loops where that instability starts reinforcing the instability. We see this in weather systems and emergence where we have properties that come out of the system with the individual components would never have created. But by pushing the systems together, you have emergent properties that are very, very difficult to uh, to test. So um, what we're trying to do is take some of these techniques and look at them uh, in terms of the societies that we have created and the inherent risks within them. But we can also take lessons from history, detecting uh, the mechanisms of failure in past societies. And to that point, over the last few years, uh, COVID uh, permitting, we've had a series of conferences uh, moving away from just quantitative mathematicians, uh, physicists, uh, economists and so forth, and bringing in historians, archaeologists and anthropologists to say, can we look at previous societies that have undergone uh, extreme changes that have collapsed their society. I know collapse is a very, very contentious term. Um, we try to use it in terms of network theory where you get disorganization, disaggregation. Um, we don't want to put any sort of cultural um, emphasis on, on collapse because some people's collapse obviously is other people's opportunities and so forth. Um, so we, we think that we've created a, a very interesting dialogue between people who are not normally brought into this area. And uh, this is not a plug for a book, but actually it is a plug for a book. We are bringing out a volume called How Worlds Collapse, um, possibly in, in early new year now, uh, where we've got about 30 chapters from these various scholars. We've got people like Joseph Tainter, who uh, an, an archeologist who uh, was one of the first uh, scholars to look at societal collapse. Um, onto some other quite eminent people. So we're trying to pull together, as I say, a multidisciplinary approach. Now, uh, what's going on in the future? Um, so the identification of, of society to, to survive exogenous shocks, exogenous shocks, I think, are acknowledged, even if some of the solutions are somewhat contested and very painfully slow to implement. And part of my portfolio life is I work for the UK government and I've been involved in net zero projects and you know the will is there um, sometimes the uh, the ability to push things forward is not necessarily there so at least we sort of under understand some of these endogenous shocks rather um, I, those potential vulnerabilities are not fully understood we don't understand how the systems all fit together so some of the systemic systemic risks that we see ahead conflict Obviously, we're seeing that at the moment, infrastructure systems that are very fragile um, and also can be attacked. Uh, financial system, 2008 onwards, uh, I think we are it's still in a very perilous state of global debt. Health, supply chains that I've spoken about, migration, food security. We have uh, a project coming up with the Stockholm Resilience Centre and the Potsdam Climate Institute over three years to look at food security, which will take into account uh, the implications of my of mass migration uh, of conflict going forward. 
Um, this, uh, I'm sure everyone's seeing this uh, uh, graphic on the right hand side, uh, looking at potential tipping points in the climate system. And that's by Tim Lenton, who's one of the collaborators and one of the authors in uh, the forthcoming uh, book. So there's a lot of potential systemic risk issues coming up. Uh, I just wanted to add technology as well. This is something I also do for the government. I just wanted to throw this in. Um, technology can also add risk. I've just gone through a series of exercises on immersive technology, uh, both as helping companies invest in the UK, but also looking at it for the Ministry of Defence. It can offer massive possibilities. It can also offer some serious downsides. Don't don't think that uh, technology is the answer to everything. Uh, geoengineering obviously um, potentially could solve these problems, but at the same time, they may be catastrophic uh, going forward. Um, can we predict tipping points? So I'm using some, some data here from some of our collaborators. So Peter Turchin, who's a quantitative historian, uh, produced a paper in 2010 using a series of variables and some various uh, um, algorithms to predict that there would be uh, societal um, dislocation in Western society uh, leading up to the 2020s. Uh, Peter got that right, so he's been uh, lauded across various uh, non-historic publications like the FT, the Guardian. Uh, is it possible to, to measure uh, societal dislocation. And then this is some work by Larry Friedman at the bottom, uh, just looking at uh, analysing empires. Empires only have up to the, up, possibly up to 300 years to, to survive. No, no getting away from uh, entropy. Even the largest entities decay eventually. So um, what we're trying to do next is to take data and look to whether we can measure at least point towards um, uh, uh, potential tipping points. So some end thoughts, we're in a very difficult period. Risks are, are increasing rapidly across all these different domains. Uh, international instability uh, is getting worse and it's absolutely amplified by climate change. No element of our life is isolated from others. Uh, GSR, we're attempting to use a multidisciplinary approach to analyze those structures and hopefully come up with some form uh, of analysis that we can we can uh, talk with other scholars, but really importantly, can we actually get to speak to policymakers? Can we make a difference? Duncan and I discussed this uh, earlier in the week. And that's one of the hardest challenges for all of us. Um, but we think using insights from systems theory, com complexity theory, and history, we can create some form of mitigating uh, 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 programs to to look at these issues and problems and reduce fragility. And uh, I'll just leave you with Edward Gibbon because we've been so seeped in classical history for the last few years. Um, if we don't, that could happen to us. Oh, that was terrific. Thank you. And I think uh, some, some some really interesting points there. I mean, we heard earlier that that climate change cannot be looked at in isolation. And I think what you, you've highlighted there is 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 really just reinforcing that. But also the fact that, you know, all, all these trends that we're seeing, um, we should be careful about assuming that they're automatically going to lead to positive or negative outcomes. I think that 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 graph you showed of the, uh, the the role of technology and how it can lead to good things and to bad things. This is something that we always have to keep in mind, not to take too deterministic an approach, but to remember that the decisions that people make really do matter. Um, we're going to turn immediately then to Lucia as our second speaker. So Lucia, over to you. Thank you, uh, Duncan. I'm just going to um, share my screen. Hopefully that works. Yeah, it's working now. Can everyone can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Excellent. Super. Um, thanks again for the kind of invitation to join the panel today. Uh, really fascinating to, to learn from various different perspectives um, about the recent research, but also perhaps uh, in this particular panel looking at the kind of how the methodologies, the ways in which we can start better understanding uh, the situation and really look forward to the future and, and identifying measures and actions that can be undertaken. So really in my short remarks today, I'd like to make some reflections on how strategic foresight and features methodologies can help decision makers better understand security implications of climate change and also really identify uh, actions and mitigation strategies. Um, 
I work for the RAND uh, Corporation, so RAND Europe is part of the RAND Corporation, and we are a not-for-profit public policy research institute. So really our mission is to help decision makers and policy makers tackle complex problems and, and identify policy options. Um, this audience will, of course, know that uh, climate change intersects uh, very closely with other security issues and very much amplifies the overall impact on conflict and instability. Um, climate change is a complex issue interconnecting with other systems. Uh, I mean, we've heard uh, the whole systems uh, approach being the kind of most appropriate way in which we can look at climate change because it really does intersect with economic, social, political, technological, environmental factors and very much amplifies the overall impact of security in issues on conflict and instability. We have heard from both kind of tactical level country specific examples in Somalia to the global implications uh, that climate change might have on, on security and have also discussed and uh, heard earlier around the the vectors through which this happens, whether that is water insecurity or uh, food security, uh, whether that is scramble for resources, access to energy, access to raw materials and critical rare earth minerals. Um, the question then that we find that decision makers often face is really how do I start making sense of these interconnected factors and principally what do they mean for my specific area of, of policy? So the question is really how do I how do I take all of this complexity and digest it in a way that allows me to make decisions that are practicable, implementable and really can contribute to making a difference, whether that is towards sustainability goals or whether that is to more, towards making greater adaptation um, policies and uh, strategies. So how can futures and foresight methods help? What can they actually do? The way we understand futures and foresight methods at RAND, and we actually have a methodology center for futures and foresight, where we kind of consolidate a lot of the methodological expertise in one place. Um, we think of them as methods that help decision makers reduce complexity and identify actionable steps to mitigate future developments. We use these methods for different, different areas and different areas of research. We have um, used them, for example, in public health context, looking at the future of antimicrobial resistance. We have used them to look at the future of transport, looking at perhaps what future of travel might look like, and therefore what does that mean for public investment into different infrastructure projects. Um, and of course, when we look at climate change, we look at it again from various different lenses, particularly defense and security, uh, and trying to understand what does climate change mean, both in terms of um, the impact on global security, but also very specifically the impact on defense, whether that is the way in which defense operates, the way in which it uh, maintains and buys its capabilities, the way in which it um, looks after its bases or training sites, the way in which it then develops and trains personnel, all of these different aspects can be approached using structured methodologies that help us better understand um, what is what are the implications of climate change and what can be done in terms of policy actions. So firstly, the, the different methods can help forecast and anticipate future change. Um, methods such as horizon scanning or trends analysis come to mind in particular. For example, one could use horizon scanning of science and technology developments to identify potential developments that could enhance climate resilience of defense capabilities or defense equipment, particularly as we look to a future where defense equipment will need to operate in perhaps different environmental conditions than it had been designed for. I mean, a lot of defense equipment takes years to uh, put into service. Sometimes we're looking at you know, 15, 20, even more 30 years uh, of operation. And therefore that equipment may not be designed to operate in uh, climate degraded environments. Um, the other area could be looking at um, technologies that enable um, operation in more extreme climates and also in terms of uh, difficult um, accessibility, maybe technologies that can enha enhance self-sufficiency uh, self or self-sustainability. Self um, the other area that futures and foresight methods can help with is to develop and explore potential possible futures, um, very much not looking to predict what the future will look like, but examine what logically consistent futures can we imagine and what would they then mean in terms of our options to adapt to them. So for example, looking at scenarios um, in which climate emergencies lead to civil unrest, food insecurity, or even increases in terrorist activity. And what does that mean, particularly for areas that are important to the UK? 
whether that's uh, uh, in countries or areas where the UK has some overseas bases or whether that's strategically important regions uh, where the UK has its uh, diplomatic interests. Um, this can be done through a variety of different methods, for example, uh, designing scenarios and using them through strategic gaming, tabletop exercises, uh, very much trying to look at uh, potential futures and the responses to them that will make us robust across multiple uh, different futures. So really trying to look at what are the kinds of things we could do now to help us make to help make us resilient if any of these futures or at least as many of these future futures as possible uh, actually end up uh, materializing in reality. So really the, the core um, point for policymakers is to help identify the, the 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 best actions the kind of most resilient actions that can be taken forward again there's a uh, ultimately a, a range of different methodologies that can help do that uh, effectively and robustly um within uh within our approaches we use for example various uh, methods to prioritize technology solutions for example systematic technology recognition evaluation and adoption method which is a bit of a mouthful but it's basically uh, a, a structured way to assess which technologies have both the uh, greatest impact, but also the um, perhaps lowest barriers in terms of implementation. There are also many other prioritization methodologies that can help identify robust plans. Um, some of these fall under what we call robust decision making, um, particularly assumption based planning, which is very much a method that tries to identify which assumptions within a particular strategy or within a particular plan are uh, most vulnerable and therefore perhaps need to be strengthened or which of them are uh, load bearing and therefore core to the implementation of the plan and kind of really trying to digest which part of my plan needs to be amended such that it is more robust against multiple possible futures. There's a vast toolkit of methodologies that um, I won't have the time to cover in, in detail, uh, but very much depending on the type of questions that um, might be asked, different methods can be used to both identify the trends and the data um, that might help us better understand what the future might look like, as well as then develop specific options and prioritize them in a structured way uh, and, and, a, and a robust way. The real benefit, I'd say, um, that we find using futures and foresight methods in the policy context, and particularly in relation to climate change, is that they um, are inherently collaborative and they are inherently multidisciplinary. Uh, many of the speakers earlier talked about the need for a whole systems approach, the the need for sort of joint uh, analysis units. I think that was uh, Christoph who, who talked about that. Um, and also, um, I think Paul just recently, just uh, a few minutes ago, also talked about the importance of looking at these complex issues in a multidisciplinary way, trying to break them down into the constituent components and understand the different facets of, of the problem. So very much bringing together, for example, through workshops or through discussions or through um, various website platforms, engagements, a group of experts and group of stakeholders who do come from different perspectives and therefore get outside of their little silos to think about these issues in a more complex and comprehensive way. Just to give you a very quick example of uh, one of the methodologies in particular, uh, horizon scanning, very conscious that this is often inter interpreted in different ways by different people. The way in which we understand it is very basically a kind of part of a broader futures capability that looks at uh, structured data collection and then analysis to identify the kind of so what, well, what do I now need to uh, do and need to look at? The data collection um, is, is very much um, around collecting the kind of data that you might need, whether that is, for example, information on various trends, political, economic, environmental, you could look at uh, collecting data on crop yields, weather patterns, temperature rise, um, as well as then uh, looking at specific types of data that may be relevant. So, for example, if we're doing a regional analysis, of course, there'll be some regionally specific data that we want to collect that can be done in an automated way, if available, or in a, in a manual way. Uh, and then through, again, a series of structured methods, looking at prioritizing and filtering the data to enable us to focus on really the most important elements to help identify uh, options for action and options for policy. So I know this has all been pretty theoretical and, and very kind of methodology focused, but I wanted to leave you with a couple of illustrative examples to just 
show you what kind of questions could I answer uh, using some of these features and foresight methods. So, for example, uh, one question could be, what are the security risks resulting from climate and environmental trends for overseas bases that defense has in the next 20 years and what actions can be taken to mitigate them? So how would I go about this as a, as a researcher at Brand? Well, firstly, we would look to identify the key trends and developments, um, whether that is uh, climate and weather patterns for those particular regions where we know we have overseas bases, food availability, water availability, if, avail if that data is available, look at some broader security risks that we might already have information on and projections for, for the future. And then, of course, look at anything that is specific to the to the region. Again, maybe available for some regions more so than others. We then look at developing possible futures. So again, perhaps using scenario methodologies, trying to understand how these different projections can logically fit together to manifest in different types of scenarios. So again, not necessarily predicting what will happen, but thinking through, OK, well, if we see a I don't know, 1.5 uh, uh, degree temperature rise. This may be the kind of uh, scenario that we find ourselves in in combination with these other security factors. Similarly, if the temperature rises more, these may be the situations and uh, particular challenges that we'll see. So really trying to look at the, the variety of different features which might uh, which we might need to be confronting. And then prioritizing and testing actions again, very much looking at identifying firstly a long list of the actions that might be taken or measures that might need, be, need to be adopted and through a structured way prioritizing what might be the most important ones to undertake, whether that is those with greatest impact, those which are most cost effective or whichever criteria uh, you end up sort of deciding on. Um, finally, when you have a, a bit of a plan as to what those measures might look like, uh, it may be a good idea to either red team it using some structured red teaming methodologies or robust decision making approaches to test that the assumptions underpinning your plan actually make sense and are robust. Finally, my uh, second example, the other question you could ask is what are the most promising science and technology development to achieve greater self-sufficiency in deployed operations in climate degraded environments? Um, this could be a piece of research which would take into account uh, science and technology development uh, that could be identified from uh, scraping the web, basically academic literature, as well as kind of technology blogs or technology updates, uh, grouping them into different types and different types of technologies um, and looking at those that may be most um, relevant for defense, which of course, as uh, James Clare also pointed out, does have its unique requirements um, for, for the way that it, in which it operates and also for the context within which it needs to deploy. Um, and identifying then prioritizing which of these technologies or solutions are the most suitable for the purposes that defense has. Um, before then developing an actual plan of how to embed them, how to adopt them in defense um, specifically. And I'm going to stop there and we'll be looking forward to some questions later. Thank you, Lucia. That was really great and uh, really helpful, I think, to see those two illustrative examples of, of these kind of methods of action. Um, in the interest of time, I think we should move straight on, though, uh, to our third speaker, Sharon. So, Sharon, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, can you hear me all right? Because uh, okay, because the icon is uh, is ambiguous as to whether I'm unmuted or not. Um, well, thank you. I really appreciate the chance to join the conversation, and um, wanted to start by taking myself right off what I was planning to say, in that um, I really appreciated both of the previous presenters. Um, for, for Paul in particular, I'm increasingly interested, at, uh, I should start with a disclaimer. Although I have a, a number of advisory roles in the current government, I do not speak for the Biden administration or the US government. I am only here speaking from my own point of view and my, my own opinions. Um, and Paul, in that regard, one of the things that really fascinated me about your conversation is I think I'm increasingly interested in that and how all these risks and trends and drivers fit together as a government, the US government does not have capacity to govern on that. Um, at, you know, one of the few exceptions is probably the global trends report that comes out of the intelligence community every four years, but even that doesn't plug into anything. You know, it's a really interesting horizon scanning report, but it doesn't plug into anything. 
And then, Lucia, I really appreciated your presentation, too, because one of the things I was going to start off by saying, uh, Chris Hodder already mentioned a number of tools that are out there, and I'm going to give you a snapshot of where the U.S. Department of Defense is with uh, climate security and environmental security tool adoption. There's a lot of tools coming online. Chris mentioned Strata, among others. Um, and there's going to be a lot more. So Bezos Earth Fund, for example, it's one of their lines of effort that they're looking at and investing in. So I think you're going to see a lot more tools coming out here. But one of the real problems with many of them is that they are they provide good information and sometimes they provide good complex inter, uh, interlocking pictures of risk uh, or other um, considerations. But not too many of them are actually actionable in the way that Lucia just just laid out in the sense that they don't they don't really support decision making, um, the sort of trade offs and prioritization that governments actually have to do, including you're deciding what you're going to invest resources in human and, and monetary resources and what you're not going to invest in. And a lot of those tools are really not geared for those purposes. So um, so. Again, we could I could go through a long list of, of really exciting developments, what's coming out, um, but I could tell you right away that they may not help uh, a government make decisions. Most of them won't. So for the Department of Defense, you know, in any given year, the Department of Defense is going to be investing hundreds of millions of dollars, the US Department of Defense, in in decision support tools for for a variety of purposes. So this is going to be modeling and simulation, scenario planning, war gaming, uh, other quantitative and qualitative analyses that help them understand what the future threat environment is going to look like and also justify the kinds of investments they want to make against that future. So this is a very robust uh, body of practice that's, that's happening year on year, uh, every year. And I, I honestly don't think that I think that it's a very large budget, of course, you know, 800 billion up above a trillion, depending on how you count, if you add nuclear weapons and veterans in there. And and all of it is justified through the use of these kinds of tools. Now, most of those tools, none of those tools at the moment incorporates things like climate security and, and non-military risk. Um, I, on the civilian side, I think we're having a, a bit of a technical issue here with Sharon. I was just checking whether it was my screen or, or, or her, so it frozen then before I interrupted. Um, so I think what we will do is we will wait and see if Sharon is going to come back. Um, but in the meantime, we'll start moving into questions. And if, if Sharon returns, uh, we will essentially uh, we will give her a chance to, to, to come back to some of those remarks she was making. Um, so to Lucia and Paul, thanks again for your questions. Um, I can see in the, the chat that we've got a couple uh, of questions coming through here. And I wonder, I mean, Sh Sharon was starting to talk about this point and I wonder, I wonder if you might pick up on it. Uh, and it relates to this question about what steps are being taken to actually ensure that the outcomes of horizon scanning and so on are actually getting down to the delivery levels of projects and programs. So really, you know, how 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 do we make sure that, that, that all this great sort of insight and information that's being produced gets down to the ground level to the people who have to actually use it? Um, well, I I, um, I think we just got Sharon might be coming back in, Duncan. Yeah. 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 Hi, Sharon. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, you you are muted just at the moment, Sharon. <laughs> well, that was super unfortunate, given that I've been on for some time without without uh, incident. 
Um, I can wrap it up very quickly then, just to say that. So in uh, in October of 2021, the the Secretary of Defense gave guidance to all defense components that they needed to start incorporating climate risk into all of the processes that the department goes through to plan for the future, strategy, campaign plans, everything. Um, they did not give implementing guidance, so there's many flowers blooming. People are, uh, the different components are taking on this guidance in a variety of different ways. Um, the biggest the biggest thing that's happening right now is that there are a number of, of war games that are being developed at the combatant commands that are, that are incorporating climate change um, and they're doing it two different ways. They're either they're building games that specifically are trying to look at climate risk for their areas of responsibility, or they are looking at how they can incorporate climate change into the, the games that they already do. And it would be hard to, to understate how important these games are to, to the way that the Department of Defense plans for the future. They are, they're integral to, to their planning. Um, so Indo-PACOM, uh, Indo-Pacific Command, Africa Command, Europe Command, Southern Command, um, I don't know if I'm leaving anybody off, but they are all actively either conducting or planning to have these games. So they're trying to get their arms around what this means for them and how to incorporate it. Um, US Africa Command is also engaged in a really interesting effort with the US Institute of Peace, where they're trying to develop a common operating picture for climate risk, meaning uh, a way to tangibly develop a, a, a risk picture that they can share with other partners um, and the U.S. Institute of Peace has made several awards to develop specific tools for that, that effort that involves everyone from this one really interesting Silicon Valley company that's using GIS and is going to work with um, a, an African university that's collecting ground truth sort of observations. International Crisis Group is developing something else for them. So they're, they're using a mix of technology and, and actual, you know, human um, eyeball sort of technology. Um, the other, a couple of other promising tools. So there's a whole list of, a whole cabinet of tools, um, and I have something coming out soon about this on early warning and risk assessment. Um, you know, there are commercial tools like Jupiter Intelligence um, or the Climate Service that are looking basically at asset level risk that are using pretty sophisticated mix of um, observations and they're not cheap. The Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense itself has something that they're calling the DCAT, the Defense Climate Assessment Tool, that is also an asset level uh, looking at bases at vulnerability of bases where they're using a, a range of sort of GIS tools to, um, to precipitation records, to um, sea level rise um, projections and all of that and, and assessing what the risk is and the vulnerability, the risk exposure and the sensitivity of their defense bases and then are going to be factoring that into their investments in resilience and, and also sort of run of the mill investments like military construction. They'll have to take account of that, those, the readouts from those assessments. And then DARPA also has uh, two different projects going on, one which I'm very familiar with, one which I'm less familiar with because I think it's, it's still fairly new. One's on tipping points. And again, these are tools that are specifically geared for decision support. Um, so they're not just, you know, thinking great thoughts tools. Um, the other one is called Cosmos, and that's under the World Modelers Program. Cosmos is an integrated assessment model that's that's taking uh, both quantitative and qualitative measures of risk. And I mean, you, you can think of any measure of risk that's out there, whether it's uh, precipitation data or UN household surveys, and it's find, developing a methodology for pushing them all together to give risk pictures. And they are so, uh, trying to integrate in um, climate projections and other projections as well. That is a very sophisticated tool. Um, it's ready to transition. And I think the US intelligence community is, is potentially gonna pick it up. And that would be great because as far as I know, our intelligence community does not currently um, do that kind of futures modeling for climate change. Uh, and for other environmental risk, which would seem to be a big oversight, um, especially you know now that there's such a big universe of technical tools. Um, as I say, there's a there's a there's a large number of tools. Some of them are old and very well established, like the famine early warning system that the U.S. Agency for International Development maintains, which is a about six month early warning system um, of famine that's to help with the placement pre placement of aid and emergency measures. 
um, all the way to something like Strata, which is more a kind of snapshot of current risk. Um, again, I think Strata is an amazing product. However, it doesn't lend itself well to, to actual government decision making um, because it's a snapshot of current risk. Um, uh, you know, also there are some really interesting things that have been around for a while, like uh, Seaborn, which is uh, a, an, uh, in the Horn of Africa is a, a regional authority maintains this. And that's just uh, a network of human observers that are out looking for for actual observations of change. And they reported and, and collected back at a headquarters level to produce uh, risk reports. So I think there's a lot of potential to, to bring those kinds of um, ground truth reports with all of the big data sort of observations that we're able to do now to, to produce much more robust um, risk and early warning systems. Um, I'm gonna stop there since I, I managed to take up a big part of my presentation with being gone, um, but I'm delighted to actually be here with all of you. Great. Th thank you, Sharon. That was uh, that, that was good recovery. So um, yeah, really, really interesting points made there. Looking at the um, looking at some of the questions that are coming in and 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 reflecting, Sharon, particularly on some of the things you said there about capacity, but also across all three presentations of what we've been shown is that there's a, there's a huge variety of tools and methods and, and 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 different ways of thinking about futures. But I suppose you know where where do you think? And and Sharon, you hinted at this slightly, so I might start with you. Where where does the capacity for doing this kind of work really lie, and where should it lie? Is it in the right place? Um, I so in the U.S. government, it resides in the U.S. Department of Defense, and and that's just I you know a quirk or an artifact of I think the American polity is that we're most comfortable making public investment in the military and in defense. And it, it's one of the few institutions in the United States that enjoys very high public confidence. So the reality is that's where a lot of our capacity is for this kind of uh, uh, foresight. I do not believe that's where it belongs. I think it belongs in the State Department and the US Agency for International Development. And honestly, at the state and community level, because that's where a lot of the decisions about security building against complex crises has to happen. Um, but realistically, in the US government, it's going to be at the Department of Defense. And there are a number of different places where the capacity is there. And that's part of the reason that people like me have spent so much time trying to emphasize how do you get the understanding of, of food security, climate security, water security, all the things, first of all, defining them as security in the first place, and then trying to figure out how to push them into the Department of Defense, both so that it's part of how they look at the future and the world, because if they don't, no one else in our government does de facto, but also that it's part of redefining what security is. You know, it's it's uh, it's in that sense, the Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine really is an interesting advent because um, in some ways it's a very traditional war. We are looking at maneuver warfare, you know, it, God help us in the 21st century who thought that was going to happen. But here we are, high intensity warfare, maneuver warfare. Um, also unconventional warfare, a little bit of everything. But what's, you know, what are some of the things at the back of it? If you listen to Olivia this morning, it's minerals, it's energy. These things are inextricable. So, I mean, we do have an opportunity now to say this is a real war. This is what it looks like. And this is why you need to understand how wheat exports and energy and water and, um, and minerals all fit together with this. So I'm hoping that that helps um, us all move forward analytically. Thanks, Sharon. And, uh, and Lucia and Paul, I'd be, be interested in your thoughts on that as well. And, and also in relation to, you know, are there other actors beyond government agencies, but I mean, gov government bodies that, that where, where this capacity lies? I mean, should should there be you know more focus on this and working with the private sector or with with other organisations as well? Uh, Lucia, I'll start with you. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I think similar to what Sharon said, there there is um, there is certainly a momentum with the defence, and of course you heard from James Clare this morning, and you'll hear from um, Lieutenant General Nuji later today. Um, there there is a momentum within within defence, kind of trying to cohere this agenda and bringing together these different perspectives. Now, does it reside solely within defence? Of course, it doesn't. I mean, it is a very much a cross government, and also not just cross government, but 
cross sort of partners and various other institutions issue. And that again has been highlighted multiple times today that you really need to um, look at the challenges from that sort of defense, security, diplomatic development perspective, which in, which includes, uh, you know, the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, which it in, which includes the um, uh, Department of Defense or the MOD within the UK context, but also some uh, NGOs and various uh, multilateral and international organizations involved more on the ground or uh, in that kind of facilitation of some of the uh, response actions towards uh, the actual impact of climate events that, that we're seeing. So sh should it be centralized or should there be a kind of ideal place where this capacity lies? I don't think that's as easy to answer and I don't think it's even possible. I mean, there are these different stakeholder groups which inevitably are focusing on different things. And given the complexity of the problem, that's actually not a bad thing because it, it really does have so many different facets um, that it's hard to imagine that there would be one single intelligence unit that would be able to capture absolutely all of these different um, aspects of it. Um, but again, events like today are brilliant in bringing together these different communities of interest and these different perspectives. Uh, in a creative way. Cool. Yeah, um, no, I, 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 I concur. Um, there, the, you're never going to have a government department that can sort this out. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I, I, I work uh, for the UK government um, in the innovation side and probably about a third of my time is, is in defence. And there are some really good programmes now going forward. Now, whether they, how, how far they make it to the ground, I don't know. Um, I've got a stepson who's uh, an officer in the Royal Navy, so I could actually give some indications of how much what comes out of the top makes it to the bottom, but I went on this forum. Um, we we do talk, we're talking to a lot of people at DOD. Um, there's a very interesting project on Foresight uh, that uh, we're working on with uh, University of Pennsylvania um, and some think tanks in Washington. So, I'll, you know, people are thinking about this. Is there a, is there a one fit solution to it. No, we, we it, this is a long slog, I'm afraid, um, and it involves uh, different actors. It involves different departments with conflicting agenda. Um, I think what we feel is that the best we can do is highlight these problems, highlight these uh, fragilities we're building into the system and hope that um, and hope that we can we can influence. But as I say, it's a it's a long slog and uh, and it doesn't help with constantly changing uh, administrations, certainly in the UK. Um, I don't know how many ministers I've been through recently in the various departments I work with, but it's very hard to get a coherent message across. But, you know, we, we can do our best and we can do our best uh, by pointing um, pointing to evidence. It has to be evidence based uh, analysis. So, um, yeah, it's it, we can do it, but it's not straightforward. So if I could get a second slot in, I, I just uh, one thing that I really would like to emphasize as well is that it's also not a one government kind of issue or one country kind of issue. I mean, clearly the international dimension is is very important. And of course, the UK already collaborates with the United States a lot in, in defense and various other issues. But again, looking at those international partnerships and cross um, kind of transnational uh, initiatives and data sharing initiatives will be just as important uh, as that kind of national approach. And Duncan, I was going to say specific to your question too. I, I think actually a lot of non-governmental organizations are are developing their own decision support tools. And uh, it, again, because there's there's so much the explosion of technology and data available, that that some of these fit for purpose tools are actually really super interesting. So the World Food Program in particular has been using technical decision support tools to help them guide especially pre-positioning of, of aid and emergency aid. So I think if you look at Mercy Corps, World Food Program, a lot of organizations like that, um, Red Cross is another one where they're they're developing new tools specifically to support their operations. And there's, I mean, there's, there's some very interesting companies working in private sector. Uh, and I've been working on a project on uh, geospatial where the amount of data coming in on global agriculture. I mean, it's really, really impressive. You can do some predictions from this. Uh, and I'm not saying, we, you know, you shouldn't have people on the ground, but you can do some foresight predictions on this data. And it's, it's, it, you know, it's some, there's some very interesting AI being developed and machine learning being developed on prediction models from this data. So, so you know, it's some, some, there's going to be some good solutions going forward. But, uh, you know, as I did try to point out, technology can go both ways. So we always have to be somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, sceptical. 
No, thank you, thank you for those comments. And uh, and Lucia, I'm particularly glad you brought out that that international dimension because I suppose that, that we have a, we have a question in the chat which is asking about how how do governments vary uh, to the extent that they give attention to to actually trying to incorporate climate change into into futures planning. And I wonder if that's a problem uh, just of attention, or if it's also about resources and capacity to actually do that. Um, and so, you know, if it, it, it's all very well that the, the UK and the US may have, have, have great resources and capacity to do these things, but in terms of confronting a global challenge, a transnational challenge, and uh, a, a challenge where it's very, very important to bring other countries along uh, along with the UK and the US on these things, how do you, how do you, I suppose, ensure that the that, that kind of shared futures are being discussed here, that, or, or at least that there's a shared sense of of what the challenge are, it, it, what the, what the challenges are, is it, it's interesting. There's been mentioned several times about this need for kind of a paradigm shift in how we think about defence and security. Um, whereas, and, and, and so historically, where where where, where defence and security organisations might have been quite cagey about some of their futures analysis, what what capacity is there to talk about these things in an open way? But in a way that gives collective ownership or a collective sense of the future, rather than you know this is kind of let's say a Western view of what the future is going to look like and the challenges, and and other parts of the world don't sort of buy into that. If we if we go in reverse order from last time, so 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 Paul, do you have any any reflections on that? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, international cooperation is important. Um, it, it, it's, but again, it's it's enormously challenging. I I was talking to somebody uh, who has just been to Africa Oil and Gas, I believe it's called. Uh, again, this is uh, from the Foreign Office in the UK. Um, basically, it's uh, yeah, we want to work with you, but you know, we are going to continue to use oil and gas. Um, you know, that's that's just our default for, until you guys can come up with the solutions. Uh, for for renewable technologies. So yeah, I mean inter international cooperation is important, but again, it's very very challenging um, because you just have these conflicting these conflicting uh, elements to it. Um, so I mean, there there's a, what I would say a, a fairly sort of low hanging fruit where you probably start, which is I mean James Clare already talked about it, NATO and and the, and, and the sort of NATO. Um, emphasis now on climate change being a, a, an important uh, security risk, which again can bring together even those smaller countries like my own Slovakia, which clearly does not have the resources to necessarily think about this in a very structured way at that government level, but also some who have actually made uh, quite significant progress, for example, the Netherlands. Um, some of the Nordic countries in particular, um, and also Germany, where perhaps not in the defense space, but certainly in the civil side of things, the um, environmental agenda has been stronger than in many other European countries. France as well. I mean, France is actually quite advanced in terms of thinking about climate change impact, not least because of the importance of uh, uh, the various countries in Africa to their uh, strategy and policy. And then I guess you move into, uh, you know, the kind of AUKUS alliance, sort of US, uh, Australia and um, in the UK and then again build on those partnerships and really understanding of well how are these different countries tackling the challenge is there something we can learn is there something that we can share before you then turn into the more challenging partners which of course is a is a more difficult uh, thing as Paul was saying. Sharon anything to add? Yeah, you know, I, you, you mentioned first uh, capacity issues and um, I think one of the really interesting capacity issues is sort of the gaps between what scientists know and what um, policymakers need to know. And, and so climate models have been oriented at understanding the geophysics of climate change um, and the, the kinds of information you need in order to do something about it as far as adaptation goes. Um, there's, there's still, I think we still need some maturing in that. Um, so I think that's a really important gap that I, I think is getting addressed now, but not, not relative to the need, let's put it that way. And then as far as collective ownership, I, I do think the IPCC reports have been an important repository of, of collective information and, um, one that I think perhaps can be used to be more, again, more actionable in the future, but it's been a really important baseline of shared understanding. 
Oh, thank you for those those responses. Uh, I think we have probably got time for for one, possibly two more questions. Right? But, but but we'll start with one. Um, and and really, this is a this is a question, I suppose, about how how successful all of this is is a, a, actually is as a process. Um, so the question that's been posed in the chat is is whether the field of climate futures for defence and security is I think I think that it's meant to say mature enough to have is is the field mature enough to already have demonstrated its predictive power. Um, so so I suppose this is a question about you know. How, how successful have have has, have, have we been so far uh, at making useful predictions about about climate related futures? Um, and uh, you know, I suppose related to that, how how do we actually know if we're 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 getting this right? How will we know that that, that our approaches are working? Yeah, it's very difficult to it's very difficult to uh, unless you start uh, looking at sort of counterfactuals to say we solved something ahead of it ahead of it happening um yeah I, I i think i think you know it's it's a maturing field it's, it's starting it has to be multidisciplinary um and i think it, it you know i i know there's been some very interesting work on uh agricultural security that that has identified conflicts ahead of time and also water as well so yeah i think it is but again it's probably in a little academic silo somewhere and it just hasn't come into this rather all embracing um new field. So yeah, I think the examples are there, but you probably need somebody to collate them. Um, possibly make a book out of them. How about that? Or a website. So Sharon, who's there? Um so are we succeeding? Um I mean I think we have to be humble about about, you know, as as the question put it, predictive power in that you know, you really, you have to, I think this goes back to Paul's caution about uh, overselling the technology and that we can't predict. We, we can only have hunches and anticipation and well-informed anticipation perhaps. So uh, that's just a general cautionary note about the, the limits to uh, foresight. Um, you know, I think for the United States, at least in our, in our national security, uh, uh, apparatus, we're still pretty new to incorporating these kinds of foresight into the other kinds of foresight we do. So I think it's too soon to say. I do think, you know, for example, the Global Trends Report has done a fairly good job of anticipating some of the major trends. As I said, the bigger problem is that it doesn't actually plug in to, to any decision making process or budgetary process. So have we translated that capacity for foresight into actual anticipatory policy? Not so much. We have, we have a long way to go on that. And, you know, just not to end on a grim note, I noticed everybody else ends on that, all the other panelists end on a happy note, but on a grim note is that, you know, for the United States, climate change continues to, to have just crazy weird cultural resonance. And so depending on what happens next week um, and in 2024, our, our, you know, new burgeoning capacity for foresight on this issue may stutter and, and stall out. So we'll see. But one last thing. Okay, hope more hopeful note. In the commercial sector, there's some really interesting tools. So we may at a political level say climate change, we don't believe in that, but uh, companies do. And they're hiring people like Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and Jupiter Intelligence to do the foresight analysis for them. So even as at a, at a public level, we, we remain, we continue to have difficulties of continuity in this space. In the private sector, they're making these investments and the tools are getting better. Uh, I couldn't agree with more with with Sharon. I mean, everything everything Sharon said kind of hold, holds true also, I think, for Europe and, and, and the UK. Perhaps one thing to, to highlight is really the, the methodologies themselves are more often than not focused around prediction. They are very much focused on being tools to help us make robust choices around the different options and actions we can take now to help us make make us resilient towards perhaps multiple different futures. So really predicting what that future would look like, that's firstly very hard and probably impossible, but also not always the purpose of those uh, methods that we discussed today. And I think, uh, look, you know, sometimes look to areas that you think, well, how are they related? The insurance sector, the modeling in the insurance sector is, is incredibly sophisticated. Um, there's uh, a lot more work going on there than possibly anywhere else. 
uh, because there is so much at risk and competitive nature will will make sure that people fully understand the risks and the investments they're making. So, so yeah, it's not just all government. How you join the two together, that's another, that's another issue. Yeah, I think I think they're all great, great points to end on and 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 really useful food for thought in terms of how how uh, how we as a collective, how the audience, members of the audience uh, can 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 take some of this thinking forward and, and continue to ensure that there's a there's a sustained focus on this um, so that so that it doesn't sort of fall apart in the way that that, that Sharon suggested. Um, we're, we're at the limit of our time now, so really what it, all it really remains for me to say is to, to say thank you once again to our speakers for their, their excellent presentations and for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I'd also like to thank our audience for, for listening in and for, for asking questions. I'm sorry that we didn't manage to cover every single question, but I'm sure um, it, our speakers won't mind if you, you follow up with them directly on, on specific points. Um, the, it's now one o'clock GMT and we're going to be breaking for lunch with the next panel starting at 1.45 GMT, and that's on acting to increase literacy and to strengthen preparedness. So with that, thank you very much. I hope everyone has a, has a good break over lunch and uh, comes back fresh for the next session.